Thanks for joining us for CBN's On the Home Front, where we highlight what the men and women of America's military do to defend our country. I'm Mark Martin. The Midwestern United States has experienced record-breaking flooding over the last few weeks, and like in most times of disaster, the U.S. National Guard is first on the front lines to help. More than 100 airmen from the 131st Bomb Wing and the 139th Airlift Wing are at work in Norborn, Missouri. Floodwaters there have caused significant damage to roadways, homes, and businesses. The airmen with the Missouri National Guard have spent several days filling more than 30,000 sandbags to stop the flooding. Service members say while it seems like a small task, experiences like this are the reason they joined the National Guard. Out here in Northern Missouri, and we're filling up sandbags to go over on Highway 10. So for me, being in the Guard, it's like being part of something bigger than yourself. It, it really makes me feel better that I'm out helping all these people that live out here. Like, it's really great. It really is. The Ohio National Guard is training for a different kind of scenario. Ohio's Combined Arms Battalion conducted several soldier readiness training exercises with the goal to get combat ready. The battalion is working hard to integrate its newest members and ensure its crews are ready to fight. We've been here at Fort Knox for about a month now, preparing for any future follow-on missions. Been able to go through all of our gunnery tables and been able to do a lot of our individual soldier readiness activities as well, such as uh, individual weapons qualifications, crew serve weapons qualifications, and some maneuver training that we're getting ready to get into today as well. Overall, the platoons are meshing with very short notice, uh, very short windows for gunnery, very short windows for collective training, uh, but all in all, I could not be more pleased with the performance of my soldiers and uh, their ability to perform and execute the mission tonight. Extensive resources at Fort Knox during the training help enhance the soldiers' ability to perform and execute missions. The terrain and weapon systems build soldiers' skills during the month-long training exercise. The Tennessee National Guard is also at work performing a mass casualty medical evacuation training exercise. The event is called Shaken Fury 2019 and is an annual exercise to prepare Guard members for rapid response situations. A federal emergency management agency leads the exercise, simulating a severe earthquake along the New Madrid seismic zone near Memphis, Tennessee. Guard members say it's always important to be prepared for any and every potentially catastrophic event. Our, our focus and our mission is on readiness. We always want to be ready for whatever the need is. So when our leaders or our governor calls and says, hey, we need the Tennessee National Guard to respond, we never want there to be a day that we are not prepared, trained, equipped, and ready. Um, we know the New Madrid is a, is a living and viable threat. Uh, so at a minimum, we need to be able to respond and uh, you know, treat the citizens uh, that may be injured or displaced during that event. But we also are aware that there are other events that may happen. There may be national disasters, man-made disasters. So the New Madrid uh, event is a real and living threat, but all of our training scenarios, uh, we, we keep them very broad-based. Um, our, our medics are trained to respond to combat as well as trauma. And so uh, we think it's very important to be ready. The exercise aims to improve the surrounding community's response to a no-notice earthquake. With natural disasters always looming, it's not just guard troops that need to be prepared to respond. Soldiers all over the world need to know how to survive in the wake of a storm. Active duty soldiers recently conducted water purification training at Brindle Lake. The troops trained with weapons on the range, weathered several severe storms, and performed field training exercises. Any, if anything catastrophic were to happen, you know, the, everyone is used to the bottled water, right? But there's a possibility that they're not going to be able to ship us water or bring it in or, you know, depending on what the event could be. Um, so the ability to be able to, you know, to come up to Brindle Lake right here and actually pull that you know, brackish water out and then be able to treat it and then, as, as you know, potable, as we tasted some earlier, um, it, it's, it's an asset that's needed. I think this training for these guys, since they don't get to come out a lot, and actually work on their equipment, I think it's it's really helpful for, for them and myself. And you know, it just makes me a better soldier on, you know, leading them, showing them how to operate it, you know, troubleshooting all the errors that, that will happen. And yeah, I think I think coming out to the field is something that we need to do more often. We have a 
a lot of great young NCOs uh, that we've empowered to, you know, try and take charge of this and, and train the young soldiers, and, and they're really, really running with it. So doing doing a great job. In other military news, U.S. Marines in Australia have teamed up with forces in the country to work on self-defense training. The Southern Jackaroo training exercise is conducted yearly in Queensland, Australia. Marines say the training aims to build and strengthen relations as well as help those involved learn to work together as a team. The train out here is enough of an enemy without even an opposing force. We spent a lot of time in the early stages of this exercise working through basic tactics, techniques, and procedures with the Australians and with the Japanese forces. From there, we came out to the bush and we're working through some of our own patrolling operations and offensive maneuvers with the Japanese and the Australians. It's a great feeling to be able to teach other people our techniques and our procedures. And moving forward, God forbid we are called to fight if any climber plays. So our allies aren't here that we're working with. We have to learn the way that they fight. So in the event that there is one, we're working collectively as one unit and not as three separate forces. And across the Pacific Ocean in Japan, special forces groups are learning how to navigate their way through the Jungle Warfare Training Center. Take a look. The reason that we do LANAV is because uh, in the course of a mission, you'll have to know where you are, where you want to be, and how to get there. And if you can't do those, if you can't know those three things and you can't navigate to where you have to go, then you can't complete your mission. Most of us, I think it's the first time that we've come and done uh, land navigation in the jungle. So we have, we have limited visibility conditions, meaning you can only see maybe a maximum of 20 or 30 meters in front of you at any time. And the terrain is very difficult. It's mountainous and there's also streams, so we have to carry our rucksacks and our kits and our weapons. Um, so carrying up, up, up and down mountains and through streams um, gives us the feeling that we're going to have when we have to conduct operations in real life. Yeah, we'll hit that. Um, so far it's, it's uh, going well. It's tough and realistic training that will prepare them to, in the event that we have to respond to a crisis and work in a field operations. After the break, the Air Force gets thousands of applications for pilot school every year, but not every aspiring pilot-to-be makes the cut. Experienced flyers share their secrets behind living out their dreams. Welcome back to On the Home Front. Instructor pilots from the largest flying group in the Air Force are sharing secrets to pilot training success. They say there are a few key tips to following your dream and taking to the sky. The first day you're going to come, you're going to check into me, you're going to sign in. Some expectations I want to have from you as far as be an officer. First thing, I know you want to fly airplanes, whether it's a fighter jet, bomber jet, cargo jet, but I need you to be an officer. So what does that mean to be an officer? It means people mission standards, okay? You are a lieutenant. Take care of people. We obviously have a mission in the Air Force, and then there is a standard, whether that's AFIs, that's your personal uh, physical standards and such as that, I need you to be an officer. Your duty days are going to be 12 hours. You will be 12 hours in the flight room. Um, that doesn't include grocery shopping, making dinner, working out. Um, that's 12 hours that you're going to be in the flight room learning how to fly airplanes, um, learning ground missions, flying airplanes, doing simulators in academics. Um, your time is going to be spoken for for those 12 hours. Outside of that 12 hours, you need to take care of all your personal issues, um, details such as doing the things like grocery shopping or working out. Um, so. Time management is absolutely key. You're going to go a full year of flying the T-6 as well as the T-38. It is an extensive year. It's going to be the most challenging year of your life. You're going to obviously study. You're going to have 12-hour days. There's going to be physical demands on you placed on your body when you get in the aircraft as far as that. You're going to obviously do physical training with yourself, with your flight, uh, with the squadron as far as that. So it is a very demanding year that we expect from you. I think every student is going to have that moment where they feel overwhelmed. They feel that uh, they maybe made a mistake, that uh, maybe they aren't cut out for pilot training. Um, and I would say to them, 
welcome to the club, your average. Uh, you're like everybody else, and that includes everybody wearing wings. Um, every single person that has wings on their chest um, had that moment. Uh, may have had several of those moments. When I was a student, I kind of took it one week at a time. So knowing what the 52-week program is going to be is one thing, but also just it's a pretty big piece of the pie to look at the whole 52 weeks. So chopping it down to, hey, what can I do to make this week successful? What can I do to make tomorrow successful? What can I do to make my next event successful? Because there's hundreds and hundreds of events throughout the pilot training experience. But just knowing, hey, I need to prepare for this event and do what I need to do for that event, and then the next event and the next event, and try not to be uh, overwhelmed by the entirety of the pilot training experience and just kind of go one event at a time with it. I think it's probably the best advice I could give to students coming in. If the Air Force uh, believes that you will be successful, and trust me, uh, they would not allow you to be here if they didn't believe that you weren't a viable candidate for going through the program, then you have no reason to question uh, yourself as to if you will be able to make it to the program. If the Air Force backs you and believes that you can make it to the program, then you can make it to the program. That willingness to learn and to be an open and receptive to feedback because you're going to get feedback, some of it positive, some of it negative throughout your pilot training experience uh, and being willing to adjust the way that you learn and the way that uh, maybe you've been comfortable learning before and looking at new ways of learning to try and make that next flight or that next simulator or that next event even better. The students that come through today's Air Force that are successful, they're great officers. They have a very ambitious attitude. They want to excel. They want to do well. They're willing to accept that we have made a mistake and I will learn from that mistake and continue on and I'll do something different about that. The ones that don't excel are the ones that will make an excuse for everything that I do wrong and I'm not willing to accept that I actually probably messed this up in life. So the ones that want to really excel are the ones that accept responsibility and are really good officers. You know, I always tell folks to advance the radar. So if you've got Arrow 101 tomorrow, make sure you have looked over and read Arrow 101 the night prior so that you can show up and engage and ready when the instructor is teaching about it. And you ask informed questions uh, and you'll get more out of the program by doing that. So try to not be playing catch up. Always try to advance the radar. Stay ahead of the game. First, the reserve liaison officer is a perfect person to go to about that. So as a reservist, you're going to have that person with you the entire way from day one all the way through. And that person has students that are a week from graduation to students that are in week one and everything in between. And the, the folks that we select for that position are super experienced. They've been there a long time. They've probably seen what you're going through as a student and can relate to that. And then the second thing is just talk to other students. And that's the beauty of the program we have at Columbus or all the bases in UPT is that there are other students that are farther along than you are that have probably gone through what you've gone through and talk to them. And the reserve liaison officer can point you in the direction of somebody maybe that's two weeks ahead of you or 20 weeks ahead of you and talk to them about those things. And use all the available resources through instructors, through on-base support agencies to, to take the opportunity to be champions of each and every part uh, of, the, of the program and to learn as much as you can. Your instructors are going to do absolutely everything in their power um, so long as you put forth the effort uh, to get you through this program and to get those wings. And as long as you are there putting forth the effort, people are going to bend over backwards to get you there. So just uh, keep showing up and keep doing your best. Coming up, hear one man's story and how he turned around a terrible situation and used it for good to motivate others. Welcome back. A recent survey by the Defense Department showed sexual assault in the American military surged in the last two years with almost a 50% increase in assaults on women in uniform. Sexual Assault Response Coordinator Alan Blair hopes by sharing his story, he will give a voice to the brave women and men in uniform who fall victim. All she could say is that they hurt me.
And growing up in my small town, there was, wasn't a whole lot for us to do. So one evening, it was me and four of my male friends, I'm just calling them my boys. We were driving in, in one car. We had four female friends that were going to this club in another car. As I was out there on the dance floor, you know, dancing with this young lady, uh, one of my friends, they came and tapped me on the shoulder. And they said, hey, we're about to take one of our female friends who came in the other car, they were about to take her outside. And they asked me if I wanted to, to go. I'm like, what, what do you mean? And I took, took a look at my female friend and it was obvious that, that she was drunk. And I turned to my friend, I'm like, you know, hey, I'm out here on the dance floor. I'm doing my thing, so I'll catch up with you guys later. And as I was walking out the club, uh, my friend, she walked across my path. And I called out her name, because I was gonna ask her, has she seen, seen my boys? So as soon as I said her name, she kind of picked up her head. She had these big tears just rolling down her face. And I was like, you know, hey, what's wrong? Um, you know, what, what happened? All she could say is that, they hurt me. I'm like, you know, who hurt you? You know what happened? And again, all she could say is that they hurt me. So in my mind, I'm like, hey, I've got to find my boys. I got to figure out what happened. And eventually I kind of found these guys kind of huddled together. And I walked up there too. I'm like, hey guys, I just saw her and she was crying. You know, what, what, what exactly did y'all do? They're like, oh yeah, Alan, you know, we brought her outside and we ended up telling a few jokes and we ended up hurting her feelings. I'm like, come on guys, seriously, what happened? No, that's what happened. Me and my boys, we got in the car and we drove back to our hometown and we all ended up going home that night. Her and her girlfriends, they ended up going home uh, and they ended up going to the police station. The next morning, the truth came out of what really happened that night. That night, my four friends took her outside and they each took turns having sex with her while she was drunk. But it didn't stop there. That night, they not only had sex with her, but they used objects that you would use for your car, and they used those objects to sexually assault her. And they ended up hurting her really bad. When I was out there on the dance floor, and they tapped me on the shoulder, and they said they were going to take her outside, I could have did something as simple as say, hey, come on now, she's drunk. I could have said something so simple and it could have stopped my boys from making a stupid decision. And it could have stopped my friend from going through a lifetime of pain. At the time that they tapped me on the shoulder, I didn't know that they were gonna do something as stupid and as horrible as what they did, but I did know that their intentions were not good. And all I had to do was just say something. Just that small thing could have stopped that bad situation from ever happening. And I always told myself, because that's something that I, I've always had to live with, I said if I'm ever in a position to make a difference, ever in a position to do something, that's what, what I would do. And I got the opportunity, serving in the military, I got the opportunity to, to take on the role of being a Sark and making a difference. So for me, I will continue doing this job as long as I have the opportunity to do so, as long as I'm able to, to make a difference. So in the last 14 years of doing this job, I've had the opportunity, and I, and I mean it truly, an opportunity to help hundreds of survivors of sexual assault. I've had the opportunity to educate thousands of individuals to try to help prevent this and kind of let people know that there's hope and there's help out there. I'm sorry, but uh, you've inspired me to do, do better and to do my part and to help others. So. Hey! <laughs> But yeah, so that's why I do. Don't go anywhere. We'll be back right after the break. Last year, the Defense Department launched a new initiative called This Is Your Military to highlight the work of service members. The initiative also aimed to dispel myths about military service and increase awareness among the American people. Using the hashtag KnowYourMill, the DOD is highlighting service members and sharing personal stories to inspire others. Becoming a Marine Corps Scout Sniper is far from easy. Sergeant and Sniper Instructor Brandon Chu says only the best candidates graduate. He shares how those who earn the title of Marine Scout Sniper will have to prove that they have what it takes.
My name is Sergeant Brandon Chu. I'm the primary marksmanship instructor at Scott Sniper Instructor School. My job encompasses training entry-level lieutenants to become Scott Sniper Platoon Commanders. I train Scott Sniper Advanced Course. I train team leaders and chief scouts on advanced marksmanship techniques, as well as instructing entry-level students on becoming a Scout Sniper. You can get rid of that. You can go up, you can saw that. The hardest now. thing for the students, I think, in this training is the uh, continued demand for excellence at all times. If you, early on, don't do very well, by the time you get to the very end, uh, your score won't be able to pick up enough. So we're constantly demanding excellence out of these Marines, and that's something that's essential to becoming a Scout Sniper. Out. Reset to where you were at. Marine Scout Snipers are the eyes, ears of the battalion commander. So it's going to be our job to conduct ground reconnaissance. Um, in a way, we differ from other reconnaissance elements. We conduct what's considered short range reconnaissance. So that means that we have to move within the enemy's threat ring. So every time I go out on patrol, I might be asked to go where the enemy can effectively engage me with his weapon systems into his area of operations so I can report on his activities to my commander. I think the most re rewarding moment as an instructor is uh, when a student tells me that I've taught him something. It doesn't matter what it is, like how big or small, I know that I'm doing my job if, if he's learning, if he grasps a new concept, if he takes it back to the fleet, even if he's not successful at scout sniper school, he still can take that skill set back to his unit and he can pass that skill set on. And for me, I just want to help increase the lethality across the force. So anytime that a student learns something that helps him kill the enemy or uh, maintain his survivability on the battlefield, um, that's, that's what's rewarding to me. And it, it feels good when a student tells me, hey, hey, thank you, Sergeant, for teaching me that. It really helped me out. That's all for today, but you can find more of our exclusive news coverage at CBNews.com. Hope you'll join us next time. Have a great day.